So that could be a problem. So we just like keep continuing. If yeah, you just continue. If I get disconnected, you just continue. And can yes. you be the host? Okay. Okay. Yeah. It should be okay. I have my bullet card. Hmm. Yeah. Around one, but I think we should be done by the time, right? Could it be around this minute or one minute? Oh, around one, not exact. Okay. Because the last uh, about two and a half hours. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Uzwal Khatri, second year graduate student. Dr. Sal, can you hear me? I can hear you, Madam. Yes? Oh, okay. I Hello guys, how are you? Namaste, so we are going to say more about cancer research. We are going to go to the presentation of the Department of Pathology at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center. We are going to go to the Monday lunch or afternoon presentation. We are going to go to the lung cancer and thyroid cancer. We are going to go to the specific mutation. We are going to go to the mutation. आई को कैंसर और माँ बन रहे हैं बारे में ऐसी मामला जाते हैं तो इस पसारी को प्रेजेंटेशन से अंग्रेजी मार्च शुरू होने सा ध्यान दे रहा सुन दिन वाला केबल जुमा ना बने आज जुरा ले मार्च शुरू होने सा अपने बने सा थैंक यू वेरी मच for attending the pathology research conference. Dr. Talbert asked me to introduce our today's seminar speaker. And we have two graduate students today. And we have Mariana Mandet and Ujio uh, Kaitri. And Ujio is doing first. But I, before I started, I got to worry you for, 
for those of you at BMSD, we are supposed to have power outage at around 1 p.m., 1 o'clock. I don't know if we're going to have power for this internet or not. So if, it, if I get disconnected, you just continue, okay? Okay. And okay, our first speaker today is Ujio Katri. Uh, he's a second year student at the Dr. Jerry Wu's laboratory. Okay, Ujio, go yes. ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rao, for the introduction. So today I will be talking on the development of novel nicotinamide derivatives as the next generation rate protein tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So just to give a brief background on rate, so it's a rearranged during transfection. Uh, rate is a protein tyrosine kinase. So uh, rate belongs to the GDNF family of ligands. So once the ligand binds to the receptor, this leads to the dimerization of the rate. So this dimerization in turn uh, results in the autophosphorylation of the downstream tyrosine kinase residues. So rate is uh, normally present uh, in chromosome 10 and it has a normal role in neural, genitourinary and thyroid development. So upon uh, the phosphorylation of the tyrosine kinase uh, tyrosine residues in the intracellular domain, uh, there are two main pathways uh, that uh, it uh, dictates. So one is the MAP kinase uh, signaling pathway through ERK, which uh, results in cell proliferation and differentiation. So the other one is the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. So this helps in the cell survival. So uh, rate uh, alterations has been found in different cancers. So one of the major uh, alteration is the rate mutation. So in sporadic medullary thyroid carcinoma, MTC, it's uh, like more than 60% of the cases have been found to have the rate mutation, whereas more than 90% of the patients have like hereditary mutation in rate. So here to list one example, one of the most common mutation is the rate M918T mutation in the kinase domain. So what it does is that it uh, makes the rate uh, ligand independent and now the rate can be activated without by ligand binding and it uh, will continuously express the downstream signaling pathway proteins resulting in uh, cell survival, proliferation and growth. So another uh, most common pathway uh, is the rate fusion with the different fusion partners. So almost 2% of the cases has been uh, seen in non-small cell lung cancer harboring one of the rate fusion where KIF5B rate fusion is one of the most common fusion. And also uh, about 10 to 20% of the fusions has been found in papillary and other thyroid carcinomas where we find CCD6 rate or NCOA4 rate fusions. So uh, the rate fusions are also seen in multiple other cancer types, but it is uh, very rare. Uh, here we can see it's less than 1% in all those different kind of cancer. So uh, the theory is the same that now the rate is ligand independent and it can activate the downstream signaling pathways through the dimerized rate fusion partners, which results in uh, cancer in both uh, lung cancer and thyroid carcinoma. So uh, to give brief overview of those fusion partners, KIF5B and CCDC6, uh, those two fusion partners are also uh, located in chromosome 10, so where rate is located. So mostly it has been reported that uh, uh, mutations occur frequently in the place where rate is located. And so when the uh, cells like DNA repair pathway occurs, then there are like two pathways, either like paracentric chromosome inversion or pericentric chromosome inversion. That leads to joining of these uh, like KIF5B or CCD6 fragments with the rate. Now what it does is that, as I showed you before, now it, it is ligand independent and it can dictate the regulation of downstream signaling pathways continuously. So now I would like to move on towards tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So also a brief background on tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Here we can see the tyrosine kinase with its ATP binding pocket and the solvent front is right here, whereas the back pocket of the kinase is right here. So there are uh, different type of tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are built in order to target those tyrosine kinases. So 
There is a, uh, an oversized type 1 tyrosine kinase inhibitors. What it does is it binds to the top of the, or the roof of the roof of the ATP binding pocket and uh, it does not allow ATP to bind to its ATP binding pocket. That, that means the tyrosine kinase is, is no longer active. So when we treat uh, for a prolonged period of time with these type of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, it has been found that uh, the tyrosine kinase develops mutation in the solvent front mutation site or the solvent front site right here. So now this tyrosine kinase inhibitor cannot bind to its original binding site and ATP can go and bind to its original ATP binding site. Now the tyrosine kinase is active. We are not killing the cancer cells. So also another type of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor is the oversized uh, bulk uh, type two tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Now what it does is that it binds to the uh, roof of the ATP pocket as well as it is able to reach to the back pocket of that ATP binding pocket. So it also works similarly that it is competing with ATP and allow, does not allow ATP to bind to it. But then there is another problem of uh, acquiring the mutation. Now the mutation is acquired at the gatekeeper's site inside of that ATP binding pocket. So this drug cannot bind to uh, its original binding site again as normally it would. Now ATP can bind to it, then the cancer cells can survive because the tyrosine kinase is active. So uh, there has been like multiple researches and uh, there are many uh, drugs available in the market now. So using like small uh, molecular like inhibitors like a type one, small and compact. What it does is that it is small that it can avoid both of those uh, gatekeeper site as well as the solvent front site and still like uh, compete with ATP and does not allow like allow the ATP to bind to its original site. So now moving more like focus towards the red uh, targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors there have been like ca cabozantinib and vandetinib used in the past and is still being used uh, uh, for red uh, altered cancer treatment but both of these drugs uh, are not red specific and they are multi kinase uh, inhibitors so what it does is that uh, not only uh, it targets red but uh, other kinases uh, and uh, such as like VZFR2, FGFR, MET, Alcaraz, and many other kinases. So multiple uh, toxicities has been found in patients and they do not tolerate uh, these drugs well. So uh, recently, FDA approved these two drugs, uh, pralcetinib, also known as blue 667, and sulfaricatinib, loxo 292, which are red specific uh, for the treatment of uh, these red altered cancers. So these blue 667 and loxo 292 uh, uh, are the recently FDA approved drugs. So both of these drugs work by like targeting the M918T uh, full length mutation as well as the gatekeeper B804 mutations. But uh, it has been already reported that it, even these uh, highly potent and red specific drugs start to develop resistance against the GA10 solvent front mutations. So here is uh, one paper where they reported uh, uh, the emergence of those uh, GA10 solvent from mutations such as GA10R, S, or GA10C, and V. So what it does is that the bulkier uh, groups uh, present in those uh, solvent front sites now uh, has the static hindrance uh, towards the LOXO-292 binding to its original binding pocket, as I already mentioned to you on that background on tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So now LOXO-292 is not able to bind uh, and go inside the ATP binding pocket to have uh, its uh, inhibitory effect. So on the bottom left uh, figure, we can see that the LOXO-292 and blue 667 both have very like lower than five nanomolar IC50 towards inhibition of rate phosphorylation compared to 23 nanomolar and 240 nanomolar of IC50 in those previously used drugs. But when they have these uh, solvent from mutations, such as in this case the GA10S mutation, we can see that LOXO292 and BLUE667, the IC50 is increased uh, very significantly compared to those just the wild type without any uh, solvent from mutations. Whereas here we can see that for Vandetinib, it didn't even reach its like 50% inhibitory effect. Uh, so on this figure, uh, 
uh, want to show you the crystal structure of uh, Loxia 292 binding to the red uh, by protein tyrosine kinase. Here we can see the G18 residue right here. This is the wild type and the V84 residue is right here. So uh, as I already told you, Loxia 292 is able to bind to this uh, uh, mutation at this site, but when there is a bulkier group present at this site, now the drug cannot even enter uh, to inhibit the red phosphorylation. So, uh, Dr. Sintim uh, at Purdue University, uh, our collaborator, started to uh, think about the possibility of using ponatinib as a potential red tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So, ponatinib is a drug uh, normally used to treat chronic myeloid leukemia or Philadelphia called chromosome positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So here on this on this crystal structure, we can see the FGFR1 ponatinib binding interaction, and this uh, G567 solvent point residue is sitting here. But the drug does not even reach to this pocket. That means it is able to. This is the hypothesis that even if there might be any mutation in this site, the drug will still be uh, able to enter the site without any interference. So ponatinib has a wide array of kinase inhibition. Uh, so you are uh, targeting multiple kinases, and it also has uh, many cardiovascular side effects. So what uh, Dr. Sintim came up with the idea is that to tweak the uh, side chain, R groups are the internal components of the rings itself in ponatinib so that we can specifically target red without having a lot of uh, off-target effects. So here uh, I, try, I want to show you one example of uh, uh, developing one analog from ponatinib which is attraction 608. So here we uh, remove the methyl group on this ring uh, by adding nitrogen. And then also we changed the methyl like uh, carbons to nitrogen on this, these rings. So uh, using the similar concept, the, they created uh, like multiple analogs using ponatinib by either removing methyl group or adding nitrogen instead of carbon or the combination of both. So uh, they utilized the main concept of necessary nitrogen, which means that instead of carbon, if we have a nitrogen, then it is able to have more intra and intramolecular interactions within those protein tyrosine kinase residues. And uh, not only it has to interact directly to the residues itself, but it can also form uh, hydrogen bonds with the high other water molecules that is in turn interacting with those protein tyrosine kinase residues. So in our lab, we screened uh, over 55 of those compounds using our BAF3 uh, KIFIB rate uh, cell lines, uh, which has both the gatekeeper BA24 mutations as well as, <coughs> sorry, as well as the solvent form mutations, uh, which are G18C, G18R, and S. So we used um, the 20 nanomolar concentration of drug just to do a preliminary screening based on the IC50 of ponatinib, which uh, we had done before. And we also used Loxu 292, Blue 667, and ponatinib as our control. So from this screening, the first step was to see the 50% inhibition in the cell viability. Then we again cut off those cell viability to 25% and then selected the top 10 potent uh, uh, nicotinamide analogs for further experiment and to do a full IC50. So here uh, we did a full IC50 of all those uh, 10 compounds compounds and the controls. Uh, for this, uh, we use the cell title grow assay by culturing the cells and treating with uh, increasing concentration of those drugs for 72 hours. And we also uh, did uh, this test to verify that uh, the cells are IL-3 dependent upon the treatment of uh, our nicotinamide analogs. Because BAF3 cells, uh, we introduced the mutation in those BAF3 cells which are originally IL-3 dependent. So here, uh, when we uh, added the drug without any IL-3, we can see that at least as 20 nanomolar, the cells are completely lost their viability. But as soon as we introduced IL-3 uh, in those cells, they come back. That means uh, HSL-4761 of the nicotinamide analog is targeting red and it's red specific. We, need, we still need to do uh, more experiments to verify that it does not target other kinases. So uh, from those 10 compounds uh, and the full IC50 performed, uh, 
we selected HSND 17, HSND 18, HSN 608, and HSN 476 to further uh, uh, experiment, uh, to do the experiments on in vitro as well as in vivo. So just to uh, give a quick outlook of this table that we can see, for example, HSND 17, uh, the IC50s are less than 30 nanomolar, but here we can see for LOXO or blue, they are almost like two micromolar uh, and seven micromolar, which is a very drastically uh, increased IC50 that shows the level of potency of these nicot nicotinamide analogs. So uh, we did, uh, we performed a Western blood experiment uh, using both the controls and the nicotinamide analogs. Here on the left uh, are the Western bloods for our controls LOXO 292 and BLUE 667. So uh, when we treated the cells of the wild type and uh, our solvent fermentation cell lines, we can see that uh, wild type the phosphorate is inhibited by LOXO 292, but it is resistant towards all those other solvent fermentation cell lines. So also uh, we did not see any cleave farb expression that uh, uh, tells us uh, if there is an apoptosis going on those cells. But on the wild type, uh, as the concentration increased, there is an expression of cleave farb. So the same thing happened with blue 667. Uh, it is also able to inhibit the KR wild type, but is resistant towards, towards the solvent from mutated cell lines. So on the right uh, is one of the nicotinamide analog HSND 17. And here we can see that the rate of phosphorylation was inhibited in as less as 40 nanomolar concentration. So for this experiment, uh, we treated uh, those, uh, these cells with uh, uh, the drug for four hours for the phosphor, uh, phosphorate expression. And uh, also we saw an increase in cleave farb expression in all four cell lines, including wild type, the gatekeeper VA24M, and Z10C and Z10R solvent permutations. So for the cleave farb, we treated the drugs, uh, the cells with the drug, these concentration of drug for 16 hours. So uh, it is clearly uh, visible that uh, in the uh, in vitro setting, we can see that HSNT17 is more potent in inhibiting these um, mutation introduced cell lines. So uh, to further verify and check the efficacy of these drugs in vivo, we used the solvent from mutation introduced cell lines, BAP3, KR, z and c so once the tumor reached uh, an optimum size of around 0.8 centimeter, we started the treatment uh, with uh, these drugs, either vehicle LOXO 292 as our control or these HSNT 17, 476, or HSN 608 as our treatment groups. So we used, used the 25 milligram per kilogram concentration of drug based on our previous experiments uh, of using like higher than 25, around 30, having little bit side effects, and 20 uh, being too low. So we used this optimum as our pre preliminary dose of 25 milligram per kilogram once daily. And we can see that the tumor reduced significantly in the treatment groups as compared to both vehicle and LOXO 292 treated groups. So uh, in summary, uh, here I presented to you that Blue 667 and LOXO 292 are the recently approved, FDA approved drugs that are used for the treatment of uh, rate altered cancers. Uh, we know that it works against the full length M918T mutation as well as the VA24M gatekeeper mutations, but it developed resistance against the GA10 solvent front side. So our main goal is to develop uh, novel like nicotinamide analogs uh, that uh, are able to inhibit both the gatekeeper and the solvent from mutations and uh, having this uh, side effects or less toxicity on other kinases rather than just rate. So moving forward, uh, we uh, are also planning to verify the efficacy of these uh, uh, these drugs on different fusion patterns, uh, like I told you in the beginning, like CCDC6 red fusion and NCOA4 red fusion. So uh, we will also verify um, uh, the efficacy of these compounds because we only started with the KIFIB rate uh, in the BAP3 cells. So we also want to uh, verify if uh, uh, these drugs are potent for the full length m 918 t mutation, as well as there is a chance of always harboring double, triple mutations, right, uh, at different sites at the same time. So we also want to test uh, if these drugs are efficacious in all those multiple rate mutations at the same cells. 
Also, uh, we want to verify because these battery cells are engineered cells. So we also want to verify uh, the eff uh, efficacy of these drugs uh, using oncogenic cell lines. So we have TPC1 and uh, LC2 cell lines which harbor CCD6 uh, rate fusion. So we will also verify the efficacy on those cell lines moving forward. So with that, uh, I would like to thank my lab members and also our collaborator. Uh, and this is our funding source. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. All right, thank you for your questions. Okay, would you back? I think I can start with you one. So uh, apparently, of course, next step will probably do some in vivo work. What's your plan on for the in vivo study with animals? Yes. So that was the preliminary experiment we did, right? So uh, we have to screen more compounds first to uh, verify, uh, to I think select a few from this large pool of drugs. Then we ha we will check for the rate inhibition in vi in vivo as well as uh, is there um, any apoptosis going on. So also moving in the future, we also have to check for the toxicity in uh, uh, the in vivo model as well. So we will be collecting organs and checking if there is any like toxicity going on in those major organs as well. Yeah, by the way, what is the solubility of the compound you are using? It's pretty solid Yes, it, it, it is soluble, but so uh, the main problem that comes with these drugs are that we are trying to modify different R groups at different uh, location or within the compound, right? So based on what we are adding, uh, sometimes we might, we see a problem with some compounds that are less soluble, but most of the time uh, these uh, compounds are soluble. But still, we are trying to select the best from this large pool with uh, the best permeability, solubility. So also, uh, uh, those all those pharmac pharmacokinetic studies, Dr. Sintim and their groups are doing over there just to see how permeable they are, how soluble they are. So how uh, the charge with the new groups we are adding uh, modifies the drug binding interaction or even in vivo. Uh, through the bloodstream, those kind of things. So those uh, researches are also being done, yes. So anyway, the compound appear to be very potent, so the solubility may not be a major problem. Sometimes low per solubility, decreased solubility may be a good thing. Yes. So you're, you're using DMSO to dissolve your compound? Yes, right? yes. It is a very soluble in DMSO, yes. But some compounds, we, we still see some compounds that are uh, not completely dissolvable. I think it, then we see the similar effect, right? Because these are the few compounds we selected. We also have the compounds that are almost the level of phenatinib, some compounds, or does not have any inhibitory effect as well, right? So. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you. Miranda is our third year student, graduate student.